wish to partake in Beckett's profound divinations, the answer is yes. But many tend to agree with A. A. Alvarez, one of Beckett's most penetrating critics, who declared, The unnameable appears flaccid and redundant. It seems to me a classic case of a work which is necessary but not sufficient, that is to say, personally necessary to Beckett in his exploration of his own limitless negation, but artistically insufficient because of its length, repetitiveness, and private claustrophobia. Beckett delighted in such philosophical distinctions between necessary and sufficient reason, which hark back to rationalist philosophers such as Descartes and Leibniz. If Beckett's trilogy is seen as an extended examination of Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, then the unnameable is undoubtedly as close a scrutiny of the qualities inherent in sum, being, as one is likely to find. But any answer to set against Alvarez's objection must confront the question, is the experience evoked in the unnameable purely subjective, or does it have universal resonance? The answer here would appear to be that such depictions belong to Beckett's crisis-ridden psychology. Most, if not all of us, do not spend our time as nameless beings in a limbo on the verge of non-existence. Yet by the same count, most of us never see a starry night as depicted by Van Gogh. The psychological disintegration is in the end irrelevant to the work, whether it be art, literature, philosophy, or quasi-religious experience. Entering into the world of the unnameable, we are led to a heightened philosophical awareness of our existence. This may appear to be no wondrous experience, as it is when we enter into the vision of Van Gogh's starry night. The operative word here is appear. For Beckett's The Unnameable is indeed a wondrous world, filled with insight into what, at its most reduced, is the nature of our condition. As Plato said, philosophy begins in wonder. The Unnameable is also a work of wonder, in its own way as wondrous as Van Gogh's so very different vision. Where Van Gogh visualizes, Beckett wonders. He wonders in all senses of the word. He questions and he marvels. Just because his latter awareness is filled with a sense of the absurdity of existence does not in any way reduce its power. So they build up hypotheses which collapse on top of one another. It's human. A lobster couldn't do it. A ah, nice mess we're in, the whole pack of us. Is it possible we're all in the same boat? No, we're in a nice mess, each in his own peculiar way. I myself have been scandalously bungled. They must be beginning to realize it. Until the voice of the unnameable finally fades away amidst the murmurs, having come to no conclusion other than the fact that there is no conclusion in any sense, except ultimate silence. It will be I, it will be the silence, where I am, I don't know, I'll never know, in the silence you don't know, you must go on, I can't go on, I'll go on. Surprising though it may seem, Beckett's precision at this final point, and others in the unnameable, leaves much open to the reader. These are the final words, the ultimate gasp of consciousness. Read them as a slow, finally diminishing, murmurous gasping as they fade before death, and they become an acquiescence to the silence, to nothingness. Read them as the last, desperate, ravening attempt of the voice to finally grasp itself and arrive at some form of understanding, and they become altogether something else. They may contain all the human fear of death. They may become a final defiance, a gesture against inevitable oblivion, even a final absurdity or an ultimate agony. It might be difficult to read the unnameable in more than limited doses, but it is open to the acclimatization of any mind. Each passage can be the gnomic prose poem of our own experience. Beckett worked in pared-down language, a reductionist vocabulary that he made very much his own. He insisted upon extreme control of his words, his phrases, even to the extent of controlling how we breathe them, how we absorb them. There is an onward flow made up of phrased breaths, lulling us into the rhythm of his voice, his thoughts. But curiously, it is this very control of his words which gives us such a great freedom in experiencing them. Precision in this one aspect allows us freedom in many others. A passage that we may read as tragedy one day can easily appear hilarious the next time we read it. 
Beckett may have been unable to grasp the impossible, but he knew very well what he was leaving open to the possible. The trilogy consists of monologues, with no director's instructions on how they should be read. We are the directors. We each learn from Beckett in our own way. The voices are enlivened by what each one of us puts into them. When Beckett had finished the second work of his trilogy, Malone Dies, he found himself at loose ends. To take his mind off things before facing up to the psychological rigours of the unnameable, he began writing the play that eventually became Waiting for Godot. As Beckett himself put it, he began to write Godot as a relaxation, to get away from the awful prose I was writing at the time. Awful, in this context, refers to the experience of writing the trilogy rather than making a qualitative judgment on its style. Beckett was certainly aware of what he was achieving, though like any artist moving into new territory, he had to live with the prospect that the critics might indeed dismiss his efforts as awful. It was ironic that this diversion, which Beckett now began writing, should eventually prove to be his best-known work. Waiting for Godot is at present the most frequently performed twentieth-century play throughout the world. Yet the entire drama centres on two derelict characters who do little other than fritter away their time, waiting for Godot. Accounting for the play's popularity is thus no easy matter. With some justice, this two-act drama has been described as a play where nothing happens twice. Others claim that it captures, in essence, the nihilistic philosophy that best characterises the twentieth century. Still others insist that it expresses a particular state of human mental evolution, one which civilized humanity has evolved to come to terms with the rigors and uncertainties, horrors and transformations that continue to underlie the comforts and apparent certainties of modern life. At the same time, there is no denying that had Waiting for Godot been staged as a medieval mystery play, its medieval audience would probably have recognized and understood many of its themes a peasant audience of the era that experienced the Black Death, would have empathized with two suffering tramps in a blighted landscape, their endless waiting for the arrival of Godot, their preoccupation with redemption, and the futility of a world in which Godot was absent, to say nothing of their absurd philosophical bickering and the broad, slapstick humor of their situation. Waiting for Godot is both archetypically twentieth century and as timeless as its reduced characters in their empty landscape. Humanity of all ages has found itself, at least momentarily, in a world where Godot appears to be absent, a world just as impossible to understand as that which Beckett portrays. Here, it would appear, is the ultimate much ado about nothing, yet it surely must be about something. So what exactly is Waiting for Godot about? To put the obvious question in its most blatant form, is Godot God? Are the two main characters, Vladimir and Estragon, waiting for some kind of divine revelation? Beckett always strongly denied that Godot was God, one of the few points on which he was uncharacteristically explicit and adamant regarding his work. But the fact remains that Godot, at least to English audiences, does contain the word God. On the other hand, to a German audience it would appear to contain an illusion of Gott and Tod, God and Death, as perhaps in God is Dead. The latter would appear to be a more likely explanation for those who require such crass simplicities. Beckett certainly detested this type of narrowing down of his work, not wishing it to be blighted by literalist interpretations. We should not search for a key to the inherent enigma. This is precisely what his work is not about. The puzzle has no correct answer. The situation cannot be resolved. If answer we need, we should seek it within ourselves and keep it there. The purpose of the play, if purpose it can be called, is to remind us of the essential situation in which we find ourselves. Waiting for Godot is a tragic comedy about atmosphere, situation, and condition, much more than it is about meaning. Its meaning could well be explained as the absence of meaning. Its action is the response of the characters to the futile situation in which they find themselves. This response is both heart-rending and hilarious. Vladimir goes towards Estragon, contemplates him a moment, then shakes him awake. Estragon. Wild gestures, incoherent words. Finally, 
Why will you never let me sleep? Vladimir, I felt lonely. Estragon, I was dreaming I was happy. Vladimir, that passed the time. Estragon, I was dreaming that— Vladimir, violently, don't tell me. One must always—